Um, uh, the first um, organization presenting is Volkswagen, and we have Anna Schneider here, who is their head of their uh, global government relations, that I believe. Glo glo Supreme Not Allied right. Commander of all uh, the of, of the car industry. Intergalactic. Intergalactic. Thank yes, sorry, intergalactic manager. Um, we're very uh, lucky to have uh, uh, Anna here today. Uh, Volkswagen is a, a very uh, um, uh, good partner with the ICCF, and we've done a lot of good stuff together. So we very much look forward to hearing uh, what's up VW's sleeve for uh, the future and now. So without any further ado, Anna Schneider. Thank you, John. Um, and, and thank you to the International Conservation Caucus Foundation for pulling this series of congressional briefings together. Um, we don't have a large government relations office, so the ICCF offers this great opportunity to reach a large audience in one fell swoop. So thank you all for being here and taking time away from your schedule. Volkswagen Group Sales and Marketing Headquarters are right here in Washington's backyard in Herndon, Virginia. And in the U.S., the Volkswagen Group is comprised of Volkswagen, Audi, Bentley, Bugatti, Lamborghini, and our captive finance company, VCI. Today's topic is particularly relevant for Volkswagen Group as we have products on the road today that are reducing our dependence on foreign oil and significantly reducing our CO2 emissions. I'm excited to tell you about them. I have to warn you, my presentation is not as slick as ICCS. Okay, why are we talking about this subject? Because oil is a finite resource. The International Energy Agency recently concluded that the production of conventional crude oil peaked at about 70 million barrels a day in 2006. It me this means that it will become harder and harder to meet the growing demand for oil as every year passes. And the demand for oil is expected to skyrocket over the next several years as millions of people in China and India and other developing nations acquire the financial means to purchase a car. Clearly, something has to change, and to be sure, this is a challenge. But with every challenge, there is an opportunity. That is why the auto industry is in a global race to achieve sustainable mobility, and Volkswagen is well positioned to take e-mobility to the mass market. In much the same way that Ford shifted attitudes about the internal combustion engine with the Model T, Volkswagen plans to stimulate global demand for electric cars. Our strategy is ambitious, to be sure, but it's grounded in an essential fact. We understand the internal combustion engine is not going to disappear overnight. Despite the introduction of the all-electric Nissan LEAF, Electric cars will not sell in large numbers unless they are fully tested, suitable for everyday use, and affordable. The most optimistic estimates suggest that electric vehicles will account for just 10% of the global market by 2020. Even if that's true, and many experts don't think that it is, it means that 90% of the cars on the road at the start of the next decade will still need gas or diesel fuel. Recognizing that reality does not mean that we are accepting the status quo, however. At Volkswagen, we are following a two-track approach. We are systematically improving the efficiency of our internal combustion engine, which includes our diesel engines, and expand the production of hybrids and electric vehicles. Our TDI clean diesel technology, which increases fuel economy by 20 to 40%, is setting new mileage standards, and the Jetta TDI actually holds the world record for fuel economy at 58 miles to, gal to the gallon. TDI-powered vehicles, the Jetta and the Audi A3, earned the Green Car of the Year Award honors at the LA Auto Show two years in a row. And the TDI version of our all-new Passat, built in our new manufacturing plant in Chattanooga, gets 43 miles per gallon on the highway better than almost any car on the road today, including every hybrid. The efficiency improvements from TDI technology are making a measurable difference. Over the past five years, Volkswagen Group has introduced its global fleets, has reduced its global fleet CO2 emissions by about 15% to 144 grams per kilometer. 20 model variants emit less than 100 grams of CO2 per kilometer. 
We believe we will soon be able to increase fuel efficiency by another 15% or more. But that's not enough. That's why we're on a two-track approach. While we're squeezing every drop of efficiency out of the internal combustion engine, we are also accelerating the development of hybrid technology and e-mobility. We are entering the hybrid market now on a very large scale. We started this year with the hybrid version of the Touareg SUV. Oops. Next year, we'll introduce a hybrid version of the Jetta. Hybrids for the Passat and the Golf, our biggest sellers globally, will soon follow. Those high volume models will take the hybrid out of the niche status. We are also pursuing some revolutionary hybrid options. A few years ago, we set out to develop the one liter car, a vehicle that could travel 100 kilometers on a single liter of fuel. That's the equivalent of 235 miles a gallon. We have achieved that goal by creating the world's most efficient car. The Volkswagen SL1 is debuted at the Qatar Auto Show earlier this year. We proved that it's possible to develop an ultra fuel efficient car that is practical for everyday use. This remarkable two-seat hybrid can be charged from a conventional household outlet. When relying on fuel, the XL1 emits just 24 grams of CO2 per kilometer. But we aren't stopping there. We are investing very heavily in zero emission electric cars. As our chairman, Dr. Martin Venture Ford, likes to say, and I quote, in the future, the heart of our brand will also be with electricity. We are pursuing all known electric traction concepts. We are also working with high-tech partners to expand our expertise in high, highly complex battery cell technology with the goal of producing battery systems and electric motors within the Volkswagen Group. Our commitment is global and it cuts across all our brands. Our goal is not to be first to market, but to be best to market. At our headquarters in Germany, we are investing more than $113 million in a new e-mobility campus that will put our e-mobility expertise literally at the heart of Volkswagen's research and development activities. The research center will house more than 1,100 automotive specialists and staff. Our Audi brand also has a new e-mobility research center with more than 800 employees. We have also invested in our electronics research lab in Belmont, California, and additional research facilities in China and Japan. The Belmont facility represents a $100 million investment, and that was just, uh, just had the grand opening on April 29th. We are testing electric vehicles in real world conditions in Europe, North America, and China. We plan to bring the first electric car, the electric e-golf, to the U.S. market in two years. We will steadily and systematically introduce other electric models as the Volkswagen Group moves towards its goal of capturing 3% of the global market in electric vehicles by 2020. It's my turn. In, I hope. in April, visitors to the New York Auto Show had a chance to see the Bully, an electric version of the VW Microbus. It's an updated version of a beloved classic. Of course, Volkswagen is not the only car company that's investing heavily in electric vehicles. But our scale and global reach give us the ability to have a major impact on the electric car market. Our worldwide deliveries last year exceeded 7 million vehicles for the first time. We are a market leader in Europe, in China, and in Brazil. We're admittedly not exactly where we want to be in the U.S. market, but we're taking steps to fix that. We have invested $4 billion in a U.S. growth strategy that will significantly increase our presence in this market. The essence of our strategy is to make quality German engineering more affordable in cars that are closely aligned with American needs and American desires. One way to do that is to build our German engineered vehicles here in the United States. The grand opening of our Chattanooga manufacturing plant occurred on May 24th. It was an extremely well attended event and the White House kindly sent U.S. Secretary of Transportation Ray LaHood to be the White House representative at this grand opening. 
The Volkswagen facility in Chattanooga already complies with U.S. LEED design standards. That's leadership in energy and environmental design. And sets new benchmarks in environmentally friendly and resource efficient plant structures and production processes. That will be the topic for another presentation. To wrap things up, though, let me conclude by saying this is an exciting time for the auto industry and an exciting time for Volkswagen. The race to develop the best electric cars is well underway, and we welcome the challenge. Fierce competition in the marketplace and smart government policies will help us tap the full potential of e-mobility and other technologies that will lead us to sustainable mobility. The future is here, and all we have to do is seize it. We can move steadily towards sustainable mobility without sacrificing quality, value, style, performance, reliability, or the fun of driving. The results will benefit our industry, our customers, and ultimately, our planet. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Anna. I'd like, uh, probably should have mentioned this earlier, uh, for the next about month and a half, we're having an alternative energy, energy efficiency month. And so a lot of our uh, great partners, and I think you saw a collage of them uh, uh, up there, we are uh, uh, bringing them in to showcase uh, what they're doing on all these various technologies and um, trying to uh, see uh, um, the potential out there and some of the um, uh, challenges and opportunities uh, for America uh, in these uh, various um, 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 different industries from uh, cars to plants to um, energy creation, et cetera, et cetera. I know we'll have Nestle and Autodesk and I believe World Wildlife Fund and Starbucks and, um, and now Qualcomm will come up and talk about what they're doing. So. Um, hope you guys can uh, come back for one of those other uh, staff uh, lunch and briefings as well. So I'd like to introduce Ignacio from uh, Qualcomm. Thank you very much, first of all, for the ICCF for this opportunity to share our work here on our own electric vehicles from Qualcomm, and of course, thanks to you, all of you for attending this session. Um, very quickly, we are bad marketing people, so you, I don't blame you. You have never heard about Qualcomm, so a few words about that. Uh, if, if, if Qualcomm is a technology company based in San Diego, California. We are responsible for the development of one of the key standards for cellular telephony cellular technology, which is CDMA. Uh, we developed that on early on the 90s, uh, very successful, uh, and now it's the base standard for all 3G uh, cellular networks around the world. Uh, and we also developed the chipset that go into those cell phones. So you have a smartphone in your pocket, very, very likely that you are carrying a Qualcomm chipset in, in there. Thank you very much for your contribution. <laughs> and at, 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 so basically, I'm here the cellular guy, the cell, the cell phone guy. And you should be asking, what the hell is this guy doing now in this electric vehicle presentation? So I just hope that at, at, at in the next 10 minutes, you will be able to relate what's the role of the communications industry in, in this electric vehicle and how we are enabling this new world of electric mobility, as Anna was mentioning before. First of all, I will mostly focus my talk around the, the charging infrastructure, which is the other side of the equation of the electric vehicle ecosystem. And basically, if you have your electric vehicle, you need to charge that vehicle to basically to be able to drive. There are three kind of charging stations that in, in this ecosystem. There's no perfect solution for the charging station, so there are three kind of them. You have the level one charging station, which is basically plugging your car into the wall outlet, okay? That's very convenient because we already have the infrastructure for charging those vehicles with level one. The issue is that it's very slow. So an electric vehicle, depending on the battery size, it could take you, I don't know, five, 10, 15 hours to charge your electric vehicle. That's not very convenient. It's very convenient in terms of location because you can plug anywhere. It's not very convenient in terms of the charging speed for your vehicle. Then we have the level two charging stations which are more powerful stations, you're required to buy one of those and install one of those in your garage, in your workplace. 
it, it, it reduces the charging time roughly by a half, okay? So it's, it's much more convenient, uh, uh, but it requires a little bit of investment there in terms of the charging infrastructure. And then you have the level three charging station, which is more similar to the concept that you have there on, on, on the fuel pump. It can charge your vehicle in, in 20, 30 minutes, but it's very expensive. It requires a lot of power uh, from the grid. It, each one of these chargers could cost as much as an electric vehicle. So it's mostly targeted to public infrastructure, not to households, not to workplaces. And what is special about the electric vehicle is that most of the time you will not charge your car in a public charging station. It's not like the fuel pump model. You will charge your car basically at, at home after you arrive from, from your workplace and you just arrive there, work, just plug your car and will charge through the night. So the next morning you have a fully charged battery to run through the day or you will charge at your workplace on a, on, a, on a second level if your employer is just makes some charging stations available for you. And then the public infrastructure infrastructure will be mostly used for, for convenience in case you're just running low power or just, just need to drive long distances in, in your electric vehicle. So different use cases, different kind of charging infrastructure, but we still have the problem that the range in the electric vehicle is fairly limited. The battery technology is, is still in development. So basically with an electric vehicle, you can have a, a range of about 50 miles, 100 miles. It, it's very limited compared with the traditional cars. Some of the solutions might be found, some of the solutions can be found uh, by investing in the car itself and car technology. But remember that this is an equation with two sides. And many of the solutions, we can just overcome them by working smartly on the, on the charging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And having the smarts in both sides, the car and the charging infrastructure can overcome many of the problems of the electric vehicle. I will mention some examples. So we know range is limited, the, the, the range is limited in the car. So it, it's very expensive, it's, it's very inconvenient to use energy from your battery to run your air conditioning or your heating system in your vehicle. So what you want is use your cell phone, for example, to instruct your car to use air conditioning or heating while it's still parked and connected to the grid. So you use, you use energy from the grid and you don't use energy from the battery to, to pre-cool your car and to leave it at 70 degrees at, at convenient temperature for you there. So another use case is that early on we expect that charging infrastructure will be limited and it still takes a couple of hours to charge your car. What you don't want is to go to a public charging station if you're running low of energy and find out that that charging station will be used for the next two or three hours. It's useless for you. So you need to know which charging stations are available right now. And that requires real-time communications. Even further, what you want is to be able to reserve that charging station from your car or from your smartphone. And therefore, when you arrive there 30 minutes later, you know that that charging station will be waiting for you. Okay. Those are kind of, of the smarts that we can build in the infrastructure to make it more convenient and again, overcome some of the challenges of the electric vehicle ecosystem without having to invest necessarily on, on, on the vehicle itself because there's some limits in, in, in the achievement that we can, we can reach out by investing in the vehicle. Other use cases there is the integration of, of the car with the grid. Uh, be able, for example, for the cars to receive energy from renewable sources like wind or solar power, which is cheaper energy. So therefore, if we can synchronize uh, availability of renewable power in the grid with the charging of electric vehicles, we can allow electric vehicle users to, uh, to, to, to be able to, uh, to access to cheaper energy rates because they are using cheaper energy from the grid and actually it's also cleaner energy. So this is a study run by the Electric Power Research Institute in California. It's a simulation of what would happen with two million electric vehicles in the California system. As I mentioned before, what you would expect is that you drive your electric vehicle during the day, you go back from work to home, and you connect your vehicle. And all vehicles will start charging as soon as they, they are plugged. The, the problem there is that you are charging during big time. So if you see here in the chart, blue is the usual behavior of the grid, and red 
is what the electric vehicles are adding in terms of the stress of the grid. I if you learn to read this chart, you will know that everything that is increasing the peak in the grid, it's bad. Basically, you, are, you need more power plants, you need more infrastructure, you need more money that at the end red payers will pay to enable all this charging of electric vehicles, okay? So we, we yes, this is, we, we have the capacity in the grid, but yes, we ha we'll have to build more power plants, we'll have to put more transformers out there. We can do better. We can do better with some intelligence. The first idea there is, okay, let's use the smart meters. Let's, for example, you apply time of use pricing and let's, let's say, charge cheaper pr energy prices at 8, uh, 8 p.m. for everyone just to set a timer and start charging at 8 p.m. in the night. Well, that could be worse. Mm -hmm. Because what you, you lose there is that something that is called Lloyd diversity. Basically, you bring all the cars charging at the very same time because everyone eh, energy is cheaper at 8 p.m. I will start just charging at 8 p.m. All cars come to the grid at 8 p.m. and the problem is worse. You have a, even a larger peak there. You need even more power plants and more infrastructure to run this. You can do better with smart charging. And basically, if you put some intelligence in the car, it, or if you put some intelligence in the charging stations, you can synchronize all this process of, of the charging infrastructure. You can synchronize some cars to start charging earlier, some cars to start charging later, and make sure that everyone will receive a bit of energy in the morning just to be ready with the batteries and, and top it out. You will be able just to access different uh, service schemes for, for users. So if, if someone is willing to pay more for energy in order to charge as soon as they plug the car, well, more than welcome, but you will pay the price for that. If you're willing to engage into the smart grid systems and allow your car to participate into the smart programs, well, energy will be cheaper for you and we will require less power plants, we will require less infrastructure. Okay. So that's what intelligence and, and, and communications bring to the table. We can do something better here, uh, not only on the car, but also on the infrastructure to, again, enable this whole ecosystem. The good thing is that in terms of the charging infrastructure and communications, uh, we, we, we don't have to develop state-of-the-art technology. Actually, the problem is that we have too much technology. We have cellular communications, we have the Wi-Fi, uh, mobile broadband, that, uh, broadband system that you have in your home, we have the smart meters in there, but we can use all the combinations, all these technologies somehow to, to make it happen and again enable all these smarts into the charging infrastructure. Uh, as Qualcomm, as, as you know, we play particularly uh, uh, on the cellular, on the cellular infrastructure, cellular communications, and we are glad that many players in the ecosystem are already seeing the value of smart communications into their platform. So both the Nissan Leaf and the Chevy Volt, the two mainstream electric vehicles already being sold in the United States, both include communications from day one. It's not optional for you. If you buy one of those vehicles, you will have communications because automakers recognize the value of having communications in that vehicle. As well, if you receive a, a charging station from Ecotality as part of the Department of Energy program, or by any charging station from any of these, these other suppliers, you will be able, again, if you want to, to get all these communication and all these capabilities into the charging stations. And this is the foundation in which we will build, we will bid, and then engaging uh, utilities, uh, automakers, and some other players in the, in this ecosystem to make the electric vehicle value proposition something that is very compelling against the traditional cars and again accelerate this this movement to electric, electric mobility. And just to summarize, uh, again, we are Qualcomm, we are doing our part and, and our efforts here in, 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 in this ecosystem, but we try to understand the larger picture. We understand that with more electric vehicle in the street First of all, we increase our energy security. What is very good with electric vehicle compared with other alternative fuels is that it's not really a diverse uh, source of energy. So we have uh, wind power, we have solar power, we have coal plants, nuclear plants. The good thing is that as soon as we have a, an install base, a, a major install base of electric vehicles in the street through policy, we can switch around the, the, the energy matrix. And, and again, we already have a diverse source of energy for mobility. Uh, 
actually it's much cheaper to drive your electric vehicle versus the internal combustion car, especially with four dollars a gallon. Okay, it, it's about a 75% discount per mile by driving your electric vehicle. So it's it's very convenient if you are able to afford one. Naturally, it reduces the carbon emissions because you can you're relying in cleaner energy versus a, 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 an average car. And again, you can even do better if you synchronize renewable energy sources with the charging of electric vehicles. And, and finally, some people call the electric vehicle the killer application of the smart grid because it enables, it allows users to be uh, concerned and to be aware of the energy use. Uh, every time that uh, gas prices go up, you see the lines at the gas stations, uh, at the Costco or any other retailer for people trying to save a couple of pennies, a couple just uh, half a dollar, uh, just topping up their car with fuel. Imagine the same behavior in terms of electricity usage. Imagine the same behavior of people just worrying about their electricity prices, worrying about the electricity use, and optimizing the use of their electricity. What would, that's uh, another of the benefits of the electric vehicle. We can extrapolate all these uh, consciousness and all this awareness on energy use from the oil to the electricity and optimize our electricity use. And with that, thank you very much for your attention here and I look forward to receiving good questions from you. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Um, before we have questions here, I'd like to also introduce Steve Kraut, who's with us here from Qualcomm. Um, and uh, you know, you can probably see his uh, face uh, here in Washington um, a lot. Um, We've also got a lot of our other uh, partners here. I think people have uh, uh, been sitting next to. I just want to really quickly just recognize Bill Millen from the Nature Conservancy, Kelly Allward from Wildlife Conservation Society, um, and I think that's all our two advisory uh, partners here uh, today. Anyway, um, we'll take questions uh, now uh, from our guests, uh, Ignacio and um, Anna. Um, if anybody would like to start off, um, we've got a roving microphone. Uh, but obviously the, there's a lot of interesting uh, um, things that were just talked about and different ideas of how to approach uh, big scale, large scale infrastructure and uh, transportation issues. Um, it seems one of you are shorter here, everybody can suddenly hear me. Um, so first question, um, Bill, do you have a... That car that you introduced this year, 200 miles per gallon. Now, is that uh, that includes the factor for when it's running on on battery? Okay. And what's its range b before the uh, uh, the gasoline kicks in? It's a plug-in hybrid, right? Can you close the? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, reserve one for me, okay. Okay. Um, question here. Do you know if that? Do you know if that's a serial or parallel plug-in hybrid? Is it more like the Volt or more like the Toyota plug-in that's coming out? You don't know. Oh. Okay. If you all would identify yourself also when you talk, just for everybody else in the room. Oh, great! Just in time for me. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, that was a that was a question from first question was from uh, Bill Millen, <laughs> second was from JJ Brown with uh, uh, Senator Hatch, and now um, Barbara Cleveland, Bar Senator yeah, so Casey's Barbara. office. Another question for Volkswagen. I thought there was a Volkswagen nat natural gas vehicle as well. It's supposed to be quite stellar as well, and, but I didn't see it listed on, on your uh, thing up there. Is that still in development or no, consideration? No, no, no. Only in Russia, wow. Hundred percent ethanol. How well does the hundred percent ethanol one run? Is that something? <laughs> Yes. 
Yes, question. Ignacia, and if you want to come over here to answer it, then maybe you can feel hear better your answers oh, <laughs> with the microphone. So keep um, the microphone with the question there, and then you y'all, sorry. Sure. Okay. Deborah, um, Senator Ron Johnson's office. How do you encourage investors, you know, the chicken before the egg, what comes first, the infrastructure or the cars versus, you know, putting money into, like, which comes first? How do you encourage people to invest in one or the other? Because people aren't going to invest in the infrastructure if the cars aren't there and the cars aren't going to be bought if there's no infrastructure to support it. So, mm -hmm. so, so if I understand correctly, the question is about the chicken and egg problem. How do you just kick, it, kick in the ecosystem? Because you need charging station to charge the cars, but you need cars in order to enable investment in charging infrastructure. And of course, uh, uh, in many of these cases, the, the, the role of, of government and, and, and federal and state support is it's, it's very, very relevant. Why, why one, some of the reasons why you see electric vehicles now in the street in several states, Nissan Leaf, Chevy Volt, and charging stations, and be, it's because of many of the programs, in, in the case of vehicles, the, the tax rebates that you can achieve. In the case of the charging infrastructure, the, the, the program from the Department of Energy with a totality to deploy charging stations in about six states plus Washington, D.C., okay? So uh, we all recognize the benefits of this ecosystem, uh, but we understand that initially the economics do not play well, especially against the traditional cars. So th that's why it's important to have initial support in, in order just to kickstart the whole ecosystem. But you can see also the results now in terms of how the tax rebates and how the, the the program for the Department of Energy are enabling some of the communities uh, with with the incentives to 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 to, to for, in, for consumers to acquire electric vehicles, and that's why, for example, here in San Diego in our offices, now it's common to see electric vehicles go go in and out because they have the incentives in in both sides of the equation in the charging infrastructure and in the electric vehicle. And I do like. With the electric vehicle, you do have the ability to charge. The, um, Ignacio showed the, the different types of batteries and what the electric vehicle can use to recharge, including a plug from your home. Uh, we, When you sell the electric vehicle, our plans, and this is what LEAF is doing, uh, we also, you, what you buy when you buy the vehicle is also the home charging station. You don't have to buy it but that reduces your charging time significantly. A traditional plug is 110 volt, will take upwards of 12 to 15 hours if you buy the charging station, and depending on the size of your battery, it can charge from four to six hours. There's also the option to go, There's and this all is driven by cost, of course. There are larger batteries that can charge and do the quick charge in 30 minutes, but with gas at $4 a gallon, we're all pulling our hair out screaming how expensive this is, but look at it globally. Our gas is still relatively cheap. And when you have 160 vehicles on the market already that get 30 miles to the gallon or more, and people aren't buying them, look at it, 50% of sales are still SUVs and trucks. We have a huge challenge in front of us because we all have to meet fuel economy standards, but there's no mandate for consumers to buy those vehicles. So we're building, you know, vehicles, the TDI Jetta. It's more fuel efficient than a hybrid, but we can't go on HOV lanes with uh, with a single occupant, which is which is a challenge to overcome. We have a perception hurdle, and yet we feel there's a statistic, and Margot Gay from EPA used this in a recent meeting. If one third of the vehicles on the road today were clean diesel, we could send back 1.4 million barrels of oil a day, and that's what we're importing from Saudi Arabia right now on a daily basis. So there are a lot of alternatives, and what car manufacturers like Volkswagen like to do is have something for every driver. I drive, I drive 25 miles to work, so clean diesel would work for me. If you're an inner city driver, hybrid would work for you. Inner city would also be ideal for the, the pure EVs, but it's very cost driven. And to get people behind the wheel of an electric vehicle, you can do that now, they're out there. And the charging infrastructure, well, it's your home. We do have the challenge. We don't have anything. You know, we have a charging station at work, but I venture to guess nobody else does. So, the benefits of being part of a manufacturing operation. Okay, we have time for any for a couple more questions. If anybody has them, I think we're uh, right here. Hi, I'm uh, Matt Reby from Senator Tommy Hill's office. I have a question for Volkswagen. Um, I know Volkswagen is a leader in clean diesel technology, and it's good to see you're also bringing hybrids. 
Um, maybe your last answer kind of precluded my question a little bit, but um, I know a few years ago you had, in, Volkswagen was talking about making a diesel hybrid, which would get something like 70 plus miles to the gallon. I was wondering what the plans are for that. We do have that. We have that diesel Polo, and we've had it at a couple auto shows. The problem is when you add two very expensive technologies into a vehicle, it doesn't double the fuel economy. So the problem is we put it in a Polo, which is our, our smallest. We don't even sell it here, but we're thinking of bringing it to the market. Um, that vehicle is a, a four-passenger subcompact, and it was selling for 35 thousand euros so fifty thousand dollars who's no one's going to buy it so there's no market for it so yeah we have it but like again when you when you add two technologies clean diesel and hybrid you can do it but they're people just are very cost driven quite frankly We had that debate yesterday. We are currently looking at, you know, what, what would be the minimum, because we just have a battery shortage right now on what we, we can bring to the U.S. We're bringing a fleet of 100 in at the end of this year, mostly for market testing, focus groups, that sort of thing. It'll be on sale in September of 2013 as a 2014 model year. And initial, initially we're looking at 30,000, but as you can imagine, the sales, the sales headquarters we would like a lot more. So it, a lot of it will be driven by demand. Right, retail, you could buy them. And I'm not, I, I shouldn't say that, because we may just start with California and so the southern states and up the east coast, because I don't know that there's a real demand for EVs in, in the Midwest. Okay. Everybody keep crashing into this. Um, thank you all for coming. Just before you leave, I will tell you, you probably we see some people from some embassies around here. Um, I think we've got Romania, um, Singapore was over there, and um, Costa Rica, Germany. So we've got, um, um, we have 36 member countries that are part of ICCF's col uh, collaboration, and we've been uh, uh, reaching out uh, to uh, help uh, start congressional caucuses or parliamentary caucuses in those countries and help with the bilateral relationships between uh, U.S. Uh, uh, lawmakers and their staff, et cetera, to talk about these issues. So um, we're trying to get involved, you all involved with your counterparts in other countries to talk about all these uh, opportunities and challenges uh, in energy, in natural resource wealth management. So um, hopefully that will also bring a little bit more um, power to the table uh, to be able to get some uh, good stuff done. Anyway, thanks for coming. Y'all are out here at 115, which I think is what we promised. So um, have a good day. <laughs>